for Pope Pius XII. I mentioned last time that he was baptized just shortly after his birth, just two days after. Of course, it is not supposed to be put off more than a week or, or two, perhaps, uh, depending on circumstances. And the judgment of an, uh, the, 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 the baptism of an infant, the, um, uh, that is not supposed to be put off any longer than, uh, than it can be because uh, there is no other way, as Pope Pius XII himself would later say, for infants to be saved uh, should they die before reaching the age of reason than through the actual sacrament of baptism. They cannot be saved by, uh, through baptism of desire. So uh, he uh, was baptized just two days after his birth, although moral theologians do actually specify that uh, it's, it's not justified to uh, to baptize uh, a baby without a priest being present unless that, that, uh, that baby is actually in danger of death. Say, Mark Bach even specifies that it could be a long time before a priest comes, they'll have a priest do it, unless there is a danger of death. The danger of death, of course, all, everything is, the only consideration is do everything possible for the salvation of that soul. But aside from that, a priest ought to do it, or somebody who has uh, been trained in the administration of baptism, say extraordinarily a deacon, uh, somebody who's been trained in that precisely because you know, it's, uh, it's the easiest sacrament to invalidate, <laughs> as we've been uh, considering very much recently. So that is also to be kept in mind. But if, uh, if a baby is in danger of death, as seriously as a, as a baby is going to die, uh, then that, that baby is to be baptized. So the, we, have, we talked about the Mortara affair a couple of years ago. And uh, the, the, uh, to make a long story short, the, uh, the, the servant girl of the Jewish family in that case understood the principles, but it seems may have uh, been rash in applying them. You have to investigate that further. But that is true, that if, it, if a, 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 say, a, a baby in a Jewish family, if, he, if he's actually about to die, then he is to be baptized, even if the parents don't want that, because Every, every, uh, everyone must do whatever he can to provide for the salvation of the soul. Yes. Okay, so uh, moving on past that, uh, we mentioned that uh, the, um, the family, of course, had a, a notable role in the counter risorgimento. So uh, risorgimento, if I haven't specified before, was the, the movement, really all of the, the revolutionary, enlightenment-inspired, French Revolution-inspired movement to unify Italy. That was the name of the general movement, the risorgimento. So the, the Pacelli family, of course, we've seen the extent to which Marc Antonio Pacelli was involved in supporting Pius IX, accompanying him into exile, uh, to in his flight to Gaeta, remember to which he had to flee dressed as a simple priest in order to avoid the the violence of the revolutionaries. So the the family is very definitely committed to opposing it, this Risorgimento, which is the Masonic agenda of the day, um, and in transient defense also of the temporal power of the papacy, but. As it, it may well be that uh, Eugenio, young Eugenio, saw the, we'll say the, uh, the unsuccessful outcome of all of that, the fact that the, the, the Freemasons ended up in control of all of Italy and of, of Rome itself, and that the Pope ended up as a prisoner in the Vatican and concluded, well, maybe if we had negotiated with these people, things would have turned out better. That it's impossible to say what exactly was going on in his mind, but that cannot be excluded, certainly, and definitely fits in with his personality. Certainly everything he demonstrated uh, as he was growing up and as every, at every point in his ecclesiastical career throughout his entire papacy, that is exactly the, uh, the let's say, the mentality that he exhibited at every turn. It took, uh, if you ever hear that somebody was excommunicated uh, by Pius XII, then that's uh, uh, that, that's a big, that says quite a bit. <laughs> so, some popes were much freer with excommunications. Say Pope Innocent III repeatedly excommunicated the Fourth Crusade, for example. Everyone, all the crusaders, they're, they're going on crusade. Uh, but that was the crusade that went very badly wrong. Uh, Pope Innocent III repeatedly, you know, more than once, excommunicated them. Uh, whereas Pius XII did not excommunicate uh, very often. 
Uh, he did. There were people who were excommunicated during his, his papacy. But uh, some, some people, looking back on it, think, how could that person not have remained uh, how could he have possibly remained unexcommunicated? How could he possibly have not been reduced to the lay state? So we'll, we'll see that. We'll see some of those characters. Some of them, no doubt, you've already touched upon in the Modern Errors uh, course for this year. But uh, there will be some. There may be some overlap here. You'll notice at a certain point will be uh, the Modern Errors course uh, naturally focuses very much on the things that those people said, whereas we will be looking at them. Uh, largely in the sen in, uh, from the, uh, the question of how did they get into positions where the things that they said would cause as much harm as they did. And that is uh, one of the things we have to lay at the feet of Pius XII, uh, unfortunately. So, uh, uh, Eugenio may well have been led to shun confrontation and conflict, which seemed to him to be counterproductive as a result of what he saw coming from his own family's involvement in this effort to oppose the Risorgimento, which was something certainly to be opposed. He would never have said that this was a good thing in itself, but simply that perhaps it could, it, the situation was badly handled. And look at the outcome. Well, we, could have, we could have handled this better, which, remember, is the reason for the, well, we, we call it the pendulating papacy. The, uh, every faction and every conclave sees that the the policies of the previous pope had some bad effects in, the, in this way or, or the other. And so let's try something else. Let's, let's vote for a candidate this time who has a different idea of how to handle things. Let's see if that works better. And so the opposite side gets, uh, wins that conclave, uh, and so to speak, wins the conclave, has its candidate elected. So in the words of Domenico Tardini, who years later served as a close associate and his undersecretary of state, Pacelli, as I say, served as the uh, Undersecretary of State for Pius XII. Pacelli preferred conciliation to confrontation and sought to persuade rather than impose. And a note on this particular character, Dom Domenico Tardini, he was in close communication with Roncalli, with John XXIII, on the, whether or not to have a council and, uh, and on, on the details of it. So he was someone with, uh, who was also closely associated with Roncalli, who we'll see, also came up during the reign of Pius XII. So just another Vatican II person <laughs> who, who is, uh, got, his, uh, got a boost during the reign of Pius XII, we'll say. So Eugenio's paternal grandfather, Marc Antonio, was convinced that the struggle between the papacy and its liberal Freemasonic nationalist opponents was not only political and military, but that the papacy had to present its case to the public to combat the propaganda and lies of the nationalist and liberal press, which sought to undermine the temporal power of the papacy. And you see why. You see all the propaganda of the time, all of the anti-papal sentiments that were everywhere, anti-Catholic, revolutionary uh, sentiments everywhere uh, in Italy, really throughout uh, Western Europe, but in Italy, definitely not excluded, and yeah, it's correct to conclude that. So motivated by the need to educate the public and nourishing the hope of preserving the sliver of territory that the papacy retained in 1861, that should be, in 1861, he played a crucial role in the formation and publication of the newspaper Osservatorio Romano. Subtitled Giornale Politico Morale, it was a frankly apologetic newspaper committed to the political and moral defense of the papacy, its temporal power, and the church as a whole. So again, you see the commitment of uh, the family to the papacy. This is still during the reign of Pius IX. Remember, he reigned from 1846 to 1878, so 1861 is right in the middle of that. So that was founded during the reign of Pius IX, who was initially elected as a softliner candidate and became very hard. And definitely he, was, he, had, he had made his turn to being hard by that point, by, by 1861, definitely, most definitely by then. In fact, uh, during the course of the American Civil War, he actually wrote to the Confederate President Jefferson Davis expressing at least personal sympathy with him. No, no foreign state ever recognized the, the Confederate States of America at any time, but Pius IX really came closest to it. And the reason was that uh, 
uh, he, he had a sympathy, at least a personal sympathy, with, uh, with the, the South uh, if, uh, in North America because he saw just as the Papal States were slowly being encroached upon and taken away from him, he saw that the, the South was slowly being subjugated and returned to the Union. And he wrote to Jefferson Davis that, I, I know what you're going through right now, <laughs> in other words. It was, uh, yes, it was a very similar situation in both places. As we've talked about before, according to the trend of the time. So Marco Antonio served as the initial director of the journal, originally created to preserve what remained of the papal state, as well as advance the interests of the Catholic Church in an age of liberalism and nationalism. So those at the time, those two things were very closely united, and actually, in fact, they still are. Because if you look at all the principles on which those nations were founded, they are exactly that. All of the principles of, 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 of liberalism, of, of enlightenment, of Freemasonic principles. And the, the fact of the matter is that just because today's conservatives plant their flags, as we've said before, both literally and metaphorically, on those nation states, it doesn't mean that the principles of those nation states have changed at all. They have not. Today's conservatives, so-called, are little more than reluctant liberals who have maintained some sense of decency and some respect for the natural law. And even that's compromised, clearly. But they retain some form. But that's, that's as conservative as today's conservatives get, which is to say uh, that uh, their, their principles, uh, really, their, their principles are the same as those of the far left. But in fact, they have to be called the inconsistent ones. Uh, and and their, their, their opposition to the far left is based on just a, a sense, a feeling for what they, they think is good and true and what is evil. And that, their instincts are correct, to an extent at least. Uh, they, you know, they have some respect for the natural law still, but they have no explanation. And they admit that sometimes, that they have no explanation for why they think this should be. And whenever you hear opposition to certain things, you know, opposition to all kinds of horrible things being thrust on children in schools, all kinds of horrible indoctrination, the opposition to it is always based on the idea, well, that shouldn't be forced on people. True, but the reason it shouldn't be forced on anybody is because that's evil. <laughs> to teach children that, the, that the, the natural law may be trampled upon is an intrinsically evil thing to do. In other words, they, it's, uh, the opposition is on the idea that they sh that shouldn't be forced on anybody because everybody should be free to think what he wants to think, and so children, sh they, should, they shouldn't be taught that. If they want that later on, well, they can accept that later on. It's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all under the surface there. So it's true. The, the opposition is true. That should, children in school should never hear any of that, obviously. But it's the reasons that they give for it that are lacking, seriously lacking. So this, all of the today's nation states, the, um, which are the strongholds, so to speak, of conservatism, are the same the product of yesterday's liberalism and nationalism. Uh, nations founded for revolutionary uh, purposes on, on revolutionary principles. So the first issue of Los Servitori Romano appeared on July 1st. 1863, following the proclamation of the Italian kingdom, which sought to make Rome, which was still under papal control, the capital. So that was, yes, that was quite the aggressive statement in 1861, the foundation of the Italian kingdom. And remember, there were already kingdoms in Italy, kingdom of Sardinia, which is Piedmont, uh, the, uh, the kingdom of the two Sicilies, uh, the, the papal states might even be, in a sense, referred to as a kingdom. The pope was truly the king, uh, the temporal king of those areas. He was not some kind of uh, republican ruler. But this is the, the idea here, being the proclamation of the unified Italian kingdom, all of Italy, the state of Italy. Now it's the Republic of Italy. But at the time, the, the form of government was, was kingdom. And that this, uh, the papal states, it's, the idea was, are part of this kingdom. It's all just Italy now. And we have the, the papal states are belong to this kingdom of Italy, and the pope is. It's, it's not as though the, all of Italy was being made into the papal state or something like that. You know, this was taking away the papal states and forcing them into um, uh, really a, a nation which was separated from the church. There's also something else famous that happened exactly 20 days after that first issue. Anybody know? 
July 21st, 1861. It was the first battle of the American Civil War, the first battle of Bull Run, otherwise known as Manassas. So all, of the, all of this is happening at the same time. Now that war is beginning as the proclamation of the Italian kingdom seeking to form a unified uh, Italy. It's all practically at the same time. So we're not, uh, skipping ahead the, through the 1860s now. We're, we're not going to go into all that. We've seen all of that already in previous years. If, you, if you've come after that, you'll have to wait a number of years before we get back to that section. Following the Sardinian seizure of the Eternal City in September 1870, during the course of the Franco-Prussian War, Marcantonio once again remained loyal to Pope Pius IX, who locked himself in the Vatican. So the Eternal City, again, indeed Rome, was seized September 1870, and one of the uh, main streets running through Rome was renamed after King Victor Emmanuel II, who was the, and then installed as the King of Italy. So it's very close also to the, what's called the Via Papale, which was the, the route along which po the popes would go from one church to another in Rome. It was right along, it's right along that, uh, very close to St. Peter's, uh, to the Vatican. And that, uh, so that was quite the affront. They started renaming things, started putting up revolutionary monuments to themselves and uh, all kinds of things like that. Again, that was in the course of the Franco-Prussian War, at the end of which Prussia have a besieging, we covered this last year, uh, besieging Paris, they proclaimed the German Empire in Versailles. So uh, in that, that uh, set into course a whole, a whole series of, of, of events that led to the First World War in 1914. But again, all of this happening at the same time. Just in 1865, so the, U the U.S. Civil War began in 1861, ended in 1865, the Franco-Prussian War, well, after, the year after that, war between Prussia and Austria to see who would be the leader of a unified Germany. Prussia wins 1870. In 1871, the Franco-Prussian War is fought, and uh, well, Prussia emerges as the absolute victor in that, and then at the end of it proclaims the German Empire uh, in, in Versailles, and then you have uh, empires, uh, you have, uh, from one end to, of, of Europe to the other, you have empires at that point. Uh, France, which was, uh, well, its empire, its, its empire was toppled at that point. Napoleon III was captured in, by the Prussians in the course of the, of the disaster for France that was the Franco-Prussian War. But France still was an empire even after the Third Republic came into existence, an empire in the sense of the extent of its territory. Uh, and then the, the British Empire was quite extensive at the time. That was the, uh, Britain was the undisputed naval superpower of the time, of the day. From the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805 until the beginning of the First World War in 1914, Britain reigned just about un, uh, um, supreme, uh, unquestioned, uh, unquestioned uh, in its supremacy for just about, uh, well, even over 100 years. And 1805 was, yes, it, it's very famously associated also with the Battle of Austerlitz, which was Napoleon's greatest triumph. He defeated everybody at that point. And he himself said later that that was the point at which he was at his most powerful, 1805. But it was also the same year as the Battle of Trafalgar, which set up Britain as the undisputed master of the seas for over 100 years. So then, uh, after that, uh, so we have, uh, France, which is still an empire, the British Empire, the German Empire, Austrian Empire, Russia is still an empire, still has uh, an emperor at that point. So you have all of these, all of the nation states established for the purpose of forwarding the revolution have all been established. And all of them, even Austria, the Catholic Empire, the Catholic nation, gave a significant amount of trouble to the church. We covered, uh, the, though actually Britain was, at the, around this time, was actually letting up for all of the wrong reasons, for all those same principles of liberalism, but was actually letting up a bit. So in the, the bitter conflict caused by the encroachments of the Italian kingdom on the church that caused so much trouble during the pontificate of Pius IX, Marcantonio refused to accept the new Italian regime. So absolutely having nothing to do with it. 
Instead, he supported the Vatican's opposition to the takeover, the opposition which came to be dubbed the Counter Risorgimento, serving the cause of the self-imposed prisoner in the Vatican. So it was, it's, it was not as though the revolutionaries forced the Pope into the Vatican and locked him up in there. It's that Pius IX refused, he, you know, he locked himself in and said, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere, not until the papal states are restored. And Leo XIII maintained that, St. Pius X maintained that, Benedict XV. And then it was only during the reign of Pius XI, we saw last year, and we will actually will cover that again this year. From, yes, more from the perspective of the Pacellis who were involved in it, but we will touch upon that again this year. The Lateran Accords of 1929, which brought about the, not the, you can't say the restoration of the Papal States, that was far more extensive, but uh, some vestige, allowed to, some tiny vestige of the Papal States to have an official existence, which was the Vatican City that we have now. That's about, it's all, that's about all that's left. But remember, even from the time of the takeover, 1870, September 1870, until 1929, as far as the Italian state was concerned, the Italian kingdom, the Pope owned nothing. He was just there. And they were always at, they, they said, oh yes, we'll put the churches at your disposal. See how generous we are. We'll take everything from you, but we'll let you use it still. So we're nice. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was seriously the idea. And it's the same thing in, in all of these formerly Catholic nations. They always they seized all the churches, and in France, well, it's at the disposal of the clergy. So it's steal everything from the church, and oh, but we're so nice, we'll let you use it. So uh, all of those popes remained prisoners in the Vatican, all in protest to the takeover of the Papal States, with always with the idea that we'll get that back eventually, and then we'll come out again. That was the idea. So Marco Antonio shared Pio Nono's call for a restoration of the Pope's temporal power as a solution to the Roman question. So the Roman question was exactly that. You have the Pope there saying, this is all still Papal territory. All the churches in Rome are all owned by the Pope. All the papal states are still owned by the Pope. He's still the temple ruler of it. Uh, the Italian kingdom saying, no, that's ours. So it was disputed, or in that sense, a question. Who actually owns this? The Roman question. So that was just, it was just suspended there in, in limbo, so to speak, for all those decades. That was the Roman question. So Marco Antonio uh, Pacelli is of uh, one mind with Pius IX and saying, well, we know what the answer to this question is, give everything back to the Pope. <laughs> Easy. But of course, the Italian kingdom was not going to do that, not, not after all the takeover they just had uh, orchestrated. But Marco Antonio certainly thinks that himself and seeks to transmit those sentiments to his entire family. And uh, people started to drop off from that, in his own, also in his own family. Well, he remained personally firm on that always, uh, Marco Antonio, uh, his family, his son and his grandsons, uh, not so much. They started to modify their stance quietly in such a way as not to offend the patriarch of the family, but they definitely modified their stance with the idea, not with the idea ever that this was a good thing, but that, well, we just need to learn how to live in this situation and we have to make certain concessions, at least in the practical order, have to learn to to take advantage of what we can in this undesirable situation. Uh, that restoration indeed never happened. Um, we'll, we will talk about what did happen, the Lateran Accords, as we talked about last year, but we'll cover that again from a, from a slightly different angle. Some family members held unwaveringly to what Italian patriots derided, the patriots as they, those who were patriotic to the, uh, the new Italian kingdom, they derided the, the cause, the papal cause, as a lost cause. Uh, why, why are you wasting your time holding on to something that's clearly lost? That's, that, that battle is over. That, that war has been fought and you lost it, so come off it now, was the idea. Why are you so loyal to the pope as a temporal ruler? And they probably were, I don't know exactly what they were telling them personally, but uh, probably something along the lines of, well, the pope, he's still there. It's not as though we tried to oust him. We wanted him to be in a position of honor but he won't take it. He's locked himself away. So uh, they, uh, they're, they're saying, why are you holding on to this lost cause? Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the black aristocracy, as it was called, re remained loyal to the pope, and we saw some of the things they did. Remember, they would, uh, so they would keep their, their blinds permanently shut so they couldn't see <laughs> what was happening in this 
the city that's been taken over by revolutionaries around them. Uh, some would even go out in public with only one glove on in the protest. At a time when people would wear dress gloves a lot, they would go out with only one glove on. Or they would put an empty chair in a prominent corner of the home. People would come in. There's a chair that nobody sits in that. That's for the Pope, but he's not allowed. He can't come here right now. <laughs> so so that they'll have to stay there empty as a reminder to everybody who's in this house that the Pope is being wronged as we speak. That's the idea. And uh, that would speak very loudly, in fact. You can see how that would be very effective. So they were scandalized by the anti-clerical outbursts in Rome and the rest of the peninsula, the confiscation of church property, the disbanding of religious orders, the drafting of priests and other religious into the army following the takeover. In other words, all the things that are in the, the, the manual for what to do when you uh, take over a nation and decide to persecute the church. Uh, you could practically write, write the book. The first step is usually to suppress the Jesuits. After that, all these other things. <laughs> all kinds of propaganda and steal the church's property, get rid of other religious, even the ones who have behaved themselves according to your rules. And it goes on. So uh, to, to protest, uh, we mentioned some of the things they did to protest, but uh, also uh, other types of protestations against these sacrilegious and scandalous developments. They shunned the national colors of red, white, and green and proudly donned the papal colors of white and gold. So they continued to wear the papal colors rather than the Italian national colors. But you'd actually, the, the Italian national colors, you don't see that flag too much in Italy. Uh, the Italians to this day are largely local, are loyal to their local regions. Probably because there have been so many, so many ruling powers in Italy for so long. Now, not, not even, uh, even after, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, there were so many barbarian tribes who came in and, and set up various different kingdoms. Uh, then uh, all kinds of other, all other nations came in and established themselves in various different parts. For example, uh, well, you know, so, uh, the other rest of Italy doesn't really look uh, upon Sicily as being, uh, as being equals with them, but uh, the Normans, for example, uh, ruled Sicily for a time. Uh, then uh, Austria and France established themselves in all different parts of of, of, of Italy, one of Napoleon's marshals even became the king of, uh, the, of, of Naples, for example. Um, another one of Napoleon's marshals became uh, about, well, the crown prince of Sweden, actually, and his, his, may have, um, and his, his, his uh, descendants are still on the throne of Sweden to this day, technically. I don't know how much power they actually have, but uh, Napoleon really got his, established his, his family and his marshals everywhere. Sometimes they would turn against him, uh, so some of those marshals. Uh, Marshal Bernadotte was the one who became crown prince of Sweden and eventually ended up fighting against him. But uh, the point is that uh, we're looking at Italy here. Many different powers have established themselves in, over, over many different centuries, and so the loyalty has largely become to the, the region um, rather than to um, some higher government, which may be there tomorrow, may not be. <laughs> you just don't know. So here, actually, here we come to the point at which the, I have in the notes that some, some families of the black aristocracy wore one glove only uh, or would uh, put an empty chair in a prominent corner of their apartments in Rome. Uh, whereas uh, Filippo Pacelli, who was born in 1837, died in 1916, uh, was uh, definitely of the same religious fervor. He was a good Catholic just as his father and was pro-papal. But he did question here, quietly of course, uh, the wisdom of Pius IX's recourse to total intransigence. Which, remember, Pius IX actually adopted because uh, he tried being nice. He was elected as the quote-unquote nice candidate, remember, and got burned very badly. He was giving all kinds of concessions. He even set up an official that the, the revolutionaries wanted who got assassinated. He wasn't, somehow he was unsatisfactory to the revolutionaries, so they stabbed him to death. And then Pius IX had to flee Rome in 1848. So after that, he figured out, being nice to these people doesn't get you anything. We'll go to the opposite. <laughs> we'll try, try the opposite tack uh, from now on. And uh, that's what he pursued. And uh, clearly even that, I mean, in a way, that, that Pius IX, his, his whole papacy proves that that's the only way you can get anywhere. Is by, uh, is by 
taking a hard line, standing on the, the rights of the church. Uh, because being nice, granting them concessions, gained him nothing. And then opposing them also gained him nothing. So strong were their forces. But if he had, had he not opposed them, how much more quickly would they have come in? Now, clearly they were not willing to, to be reasonable. So really, you could, you could make a case just based on that. But here, looking at the, the, the dates for the life of Filippo Pacelli, he was born at the beginning of, of one era and died at the end of another. Anybody know which, uh, which uh, those two dates are associated with? Two very long reigns in Europe, that's a big hint. Anybody have any ideas whose reigns those were? One was Queen Victoria, who reigned from 1837 to 1901. And the other was uh, Franz Joseph. I'd have to check the date for the beginning of his reign, but he died in 1916 after many decades. So, uh, anyway, uh, that aside. Uh, he did question the wisdom of Pius IX's recourse to total intransigence. Uh, both he and his brother Francesco favored a more pragmatic and flexible approach to the Italian state they regretfully but realistically regarded as a permanent fixture. And as it turns out, in the long run, correctly. They were actually correct in that, as, you know, as history has indicated, you know, the Italian state is still there. And of course, the Novus Order would never ask for papal, the papal states back. But uh, I mean, that was given up. Any idea of restoring that was given up under Pius XI, um, decades before Vatican II. So Filippo, who uh, shared his father's interest in the law as well as his living quarters, kept his sentiments to himself, which uh, is as well advised in doing that, but later indirectly transmitted them to his children. So you see how this happens. Mark Antonio, during the reign of Pius IX, is a hardliner all the way to the end. Uh, whereas Filippo, well, maybe we have to learn to deal with this, and transmits that to his children, one of whom is Eugenio. And in uh, October 1871, uh, he married Donna Virginia Graziosi, who was also from a traditionally quote unquote black Italian family from Acqua Pendente near Viterbo, from a noble and ultramontane family. Now that's, uh, that's actually something in their favor. That's usually used as a derogative term. It was, uh, it's a, it was a term cooked up by liberals who derided Catholics who looked to Rome, to the Pope, for their guidance. Ultramontane, meaning across the Alps. Why are you looking across the Alps, to south to Rome, across the mountains, where Rome is, where the Pope lives? Why are you looking there? Why are you looking beyond the mountains? Ultramontane. Why are you doing that? You know, these these ultra, ultramontanes or ultramontanists. That was invented as a derogatory term. But as is many times the case, the best praise is intended as an insult. Uh, what that means is that actually you're submissive to the divinely instituted authority of the, of the papacy, uh, to the divinely instituted Catholic Church. In other words, she came from a, a pro-papal, uh, devout Catholic family. So we're, this is the, the bottom line here. Two of her sisters became nuns and two of her brothers priests. So very, clearly a very pious family. They too remained devoted to the papacy and likewise supported the Count of Risorgimento. Uh, uh, they had uh, four children. So uh, Pius XII, uh, in addition to Pius XII himself, uh, future Pope Pius XII, uh, his two sisters and his older brother Francesco, who uh, married and embarked on a legal career that pleased his father. Uh, uh, but both of the sisters also married. So Pius both ended up being uh, from among his, his, um, his family, the only one who ended up entering uh, the, the clergy. Uh, Marco Antonio uh, shunned national politics. So after the establishment of the Italian state, when there is uh, the, have the Italian kingdom and there's nothing else to do, uh, but learn to figure out what to, how to deal with the situation in which you actually find yourself, uh, he uh, uh, abided by Pius IX's Non Expedit of 1868, even before the fall of, of Rome itself, but after the establishment of the Italian kingdom and well into the, uh, the takeover of the Papal States. There was little to nothing left by that point aside, aside from Rome itself. Um, his Non Expedit deems Catholic partic participation in Italian political life inexpedient. So that's what non-expedite indeed means. It is not expedient. It's really something you ought not to do. 
but it's not as strong, though, actually, as the known lichet, which means it is not licit or not permitted. That's the idea. That's a no-no. <laughs> right, that's, how, that's how popes uh, forbid things. Non licet. It is not, it is not allowed. And that uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth issued in 1886. And uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, in reaction to Pius the Ninth, turned hard, was elected as the as the soft candidate. And a lot of things happened during his reign as well that contributed ultimately to Vatican II. In fact, given certain things that happened during his reign, I can only say that it's surprising that Vatican II happened as late as the 1960s. Uh, you may remember having covered last year the Congress of Religions in Chicago. Uh, if you were to guess the date, if it happened in, in the 90s, okay, 1990s, that makes sense. 1890s. In the 1890s, 1893. Uh, the, you may remember it's part of the Columbian Exposition in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, this Congress of Religions extremely ecumenical and uh, really, really very scandalous. And you may remember also that there was a, some was an Indian spokesman there who said, oh, why, why are all of you people, why are all of you talking about religion all the time? There's so much suffering. We need to focus on just relieving people's suffering. So stop talking about religion so much. But, but that, those are the kinds of speeches that were given, uh, focusing on commonality. I mean, <laughs> you could not get if it had happened in 1993, you would have said, okay, that makes sense for the time. <laughs> but it was 1893. Uh, another way to look at it is this, that at the beginning of the reign of Pope Leo XIII, there were no modernists. At the end of it, there were. And St. Pius X elected the year that Leo XIII died, spent his entire papacy, uh, which was about 11 years altogether, dealing with it. And everything, the only, the only thing we can say is that it was the reign of St. Pius X that stunted the modernist agenda so much that they had to, they had to regroup, uh, take on new tactics, uh, such, as, such as were adopted by the people you're studying in modern errors currently, in order to rem uh, remain under the radar after the reign of St. Pius X had so, so absolutely blown the top off of uh, of modernism stated much more clearly. And it took them decades longer than, it's impossible to say what would have happened if Cardinal Rampolla, for example, had been elected instead of Cardinal Sarto in 1903. It's impossible to say what would have happened exactly or how much earlier, if indeed earlier, if that hypothesis is correct, that Vatican II would have happened. But it's, there's a high probability that it would have happened much earlier. Maybe the, it's hard, hard to say exactly, but probably much earlier. And, and, but it took decades longer for modernists to restructure their, their attack plan, so to speak, uh, due to the reign of St. Pius X. Can't see any other explanation for that. But then, even Pope Leo XIII, in other words, issued this non licet as, as relatively soft as he was in practice. We covered that, that he was always perfectly orthodox in all of his documents. His, his encyclicals are great. You read some of his encyclicals, Leo XIII, it's, it's not only an excellent Latin exercise, but is also, the material is excellent and highly edifying. So in, in, in doctrine, he was absolutely perfect, because he was an actual pope who intended the good of the church, habitually. <laughs> uh, therefore, that works out. But in practice, it is possible for a pope to be imprudent or to be, uh, to be soft, even, even in a sense to be liberal in the practical order to allow things to happen which, in, in retrospect, you could argue, make a very strong case or not to have happened. Yes, in retrospect, it's easy to, it's easy to say, but even at the time, you, know, you can think, you can only imagine living through this. Why was, say, for the Congress of Religions, how could that have been allowed to happen, for example? So Leo XIII did indeed issue his known lichet, uh, which virtually prohibited Catholic involvement in the illicit kingdom. So it wasn't called the Italian kingdom by the popes, it was called the illicit kingdom. <laughs> this kingdom whose existence is illicit. So you look at though the dates of the reign of Leo XIII, which we covered last year, 25 years. <laughs> that, uh, not as long as Pius IX, from, who, who reigned for uh, 32 years, the longest reign on record, but still very long, 25 years. So that means you had more than the final 
50 years of the 19th century uh, covered by the reign of two popes. So that means that their, their policies have a tremendous impact on what we have now. And indeed, you see that to this day. Which is what we're currently looking at. So Filippo, when he had time, distributed religious literature in the various parishes to stem the tide of de-Christianization, which was being promoted by anti-clerical elements allied to the national regime. So clearly here he doesn't think that the, that the national regime is a good thing, obviously. He indicates that not only in, in, in words, but also in practice, by taking uh, active, uh, or ma making active uh, efforts, very active efforts to try to stem uh, the, you know, the separation of church and state here, and in fact the imposition of, of anti-clerical sentiments uh, and anti-Catholic anti in every way, uh, ideas on, on, on the people living in Italy. So he did not, well, privately though, he did not share his father's intransigence regarding the Italian kingdom and believed that eventually there would be a reconciliation to the bitter conflict. So. Uh, eventually, uh, if you want to call the Lateran Accords in 1929 a reconciliation, that's true, uh, but that itself was pretty stormy, taking into account the character of both Benito Mussolini and Pius XI, uh, that was quite the battle, quite the battle of personalities, quite the battle of wills, uh, that uh, resulted in quite a few storms. Pius XI was, he was famous for having a temper, he would be heard screaming at people in his office down, down the hall. <laughs> he was, uh, he was had a fiery temperament, that's for sure. Uh, but he was, uh, that, but, that, but that meant that he was someone who actually was willing to stand up to Mussolini, who was, uh, uh, Il Duce had built up this whole, this whole cult around himself, which actually Adolf Hitler fell prey to as well. That's why D Der Führer in German is the Italian, it was the German translation of Il Duce. Uh, Mussolini was just his idol. And we could spend time talking about that, but that's, that's why he sent troops to, 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 um, to North Africa, for example, uh, in order to shore up Mussolini's failing war effort there, because he didn't want to see his idol go down. There was little other reason for German troops to be fighting in Africa, but that's another story. Uh, the sentiment of belief, that is a, uh, Filippo Pacelli's belief that there would eventually be a reconciliation between the church and the uh, Italian kingdom, or at least some practical arrangement that would be toler at least tolerable to everybody, he transmitted to his two sons, both of whom later enthusiastically supported the Lateran Accords of 1929, which effected, effected the reconciliation between the Catholic Church and the Italian state. In, fra in fact, Francesco Pacelli, along with his younger brother, that is, uh, Eugenio Pacelli's encouragement, alongside Cardinal Gaspari, negotiated the settlement. So Francesco Pacelli, the older brother, the one who was married and who pursued a legal career, he was very heavily involved. Now, Eugenio was, was, was not out of the picture by any means, but Francesco Pacelli was very heavily involved in the negotiations next to Cardinal Gaspari, who was, uh, had, some, had some flaws, we'll say. Uh, Cardinal Gaspari was another one of those characters who had a very long career. He was never elected pope. Uh, Pius XI was uh, Mastai, uh, well, sorry, that's Pius IX. Uh, Pius IX was Mastai Ferti. Pius XI was Cardinal Ratti. He was elected as the compromise candidate uh, upon the, the death of Benedict XV in 1922. Uh, but Car Cardinal Gaspari was, uh, never became uh, pope, but he was one of those characters who had a very long career. Uh, for example, during the reign of Leo XIII, he, uh, he was around for the, uh, uh, Leo XIII's proclamation that Anglican orders were absolutely null and utterly void, which is a, also a, uh, a modifier that we give to Novus Ordo Episcopal Consecrations. <laughs> it's the title of Father Chicada's article on that, which, with which you may be familiar. But in that whole thing, Cardinal Gaspari actually, but prior to Leo XIII's proclamation on that, Cardinal Gaspari was of the opinion that Anglican orders were valid, for example. Uh, he was uh, an expert canonist, there's no doubt of that. He was very much involved, we'll see that. He, he collaborated actually uh, later on. Uh, 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 Pacelli uh, would be, in, uh, uh, Eugenio Pacelli would uh, collaborate closely with Cardinal Gaspari in compiling, the, putting together the Code of Canon Law that St. Pius X had commissioned to be done and that Benedict XV 
later promulgated in 1917. He's an expert canonist, no question of his expertise on that. But uh, he also, uh, there were some people who came, some modernists who came to him during the, uh, during the reign of St. Pius X, as I recall, was Buonayuti was one of them, the one who was you know, excommunicated by Benedict XV later on, I believe, I believe it was he, who came to Cardinal Gaspari along with another modernist. And Cardinal Gaspari gave them this whole uh, explanation as to why they could take the anti-modernist oath, and that was okay for them to do, even though they were actually modernists. He gave them, he, he tried to, he gave them a supposed justification for doing that. That's Cardinal Gaspari. So Filippo, like many other fathers, hoped that his sons would follow in his footsteps and serve as lawyers for the Vatican, as well as practice before the state courts. And this was one of the main reasons why he sent them to the Ennio Corino Visconti Lyceum. So uh, that's uh, Lyceum is a type of school, uh, the Ennio Corino Visconti. Uh, we'll see a bit more about that in a moment. Here, Filippo's two sons received a broad classical education, which put them in touch with the world their grandfather shunned. In other words, we'll say that that was a state-run institution that... Uh, that Marco Antonio would have had nothing to do with. He would never have put his own son in that school. So Eugenio's generation uh, followed the family tradition in preserving their commitment and connection to the Vatican while adopting uh, their father's pragmatic attitude toward the Italian state. And we'll say that that was, as we said before, very much in accordance with Eugenio's personality, and uh, he would maintain those policies throughout his papacy, throughout his entire ecclesiastical career and most of all through his, also his long papacy. It lasted nearly 20 years. So a number of observers have, according to the author of, the, of this biography on Pius XII from whom these notes come, a number of observers have mistakenly assumed that Eugenio's assumption of high ecclesiastical office culminating in the papacy led to his social isolation, aloofness, and sense of superiority. In fact, Eugenio exhibited all of these characteristics as a young boy. So it was very much his personality. So both the sentiments transmitted to him by his father and his own natural inclinations brought about the product that he was. An introvert from a young age, he remained a solitary figure who said little about himself. He was different from other children his age. He was nearly always alone, one observer noted. He preferred to keep to himself to remain detached. The boy seemed to find his own company sufficient. So that is the exact point that we were making earlier. By, by temperament, he was introspective and reclusive. And like his parents, passionate about the Catholic Church, to which he gave his total loyalty and first obedience, and expected other Catholics to do the same, which clearly not all Catholics throughout history have actually done. Uh, but um, in this sense, yes, he would Himself, we'll see that also throughout his reign, you know, being a, a, also a true pope who actually in, habitually tends to go to the church, was perfect in his, dogma, uh, his doctrine, in the dogmas he defined, right? uh, very famously the dogma of the Assumption, one of them. And so he was, uh, on a level of doctrine, perfect, as every other pope. Uh, but in the practical order, yes, not, not St. Pius X, whom he canonized, actually. So it's interesting that he did that. His policies, his practical, his policies in the practical order were so different from those of St. Pius X, yet he was the one who canonized St. Pius X. And clearly, uh, and we'll see that, watch it what, during the reign of St. Pius X, he was entirely in agreement with the, uh, what everything St. Pius X was doing, but himself never actually fronted any of it. He was always there, cooperating with it, definitely in favor. He never came under suspicion for being a modernist, definitely not. No, not as Roncalli did, <laughs> and that, that, that we'll get to later. Uh, but he, he never, he, always, he was always quiet about how he did things. Uh, he, never, he was never the one to come out and discipline anybody up front, for example. He always wanted to be nice about things. So when he became, came to be the one in charge, clearly he could not find the, uh, the, the strength of character to, to be as hard on the people whose problems he clearly saw, and he was involved in dealing with round one, so to speak. Uh, he, he knew what the problems were that he was dealing with, but just never cracked down on them. And in fact, they came up during his reign. So, to be continued. 
nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Subitum presidium confugimus Sancti de Genitrix, nostras deprecationes et espicias, in necessitatibus era periculis cuntis libera nos semper virgo gloriosa et benedicta. Amen. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.